Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougall. Uh, if you guys are not familiar, I am the event coordinator at Murder by the Book, and we're so excited uh, to bring you tonight's event. But before we get started, I just wanted to make a couple of quick brief announcements while we're kind of waiting for people to find their way to us after they get their notifications that we've gone live. So as I mentioned, I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book, or at home at the moment. Um, but uh, thanks for joining us this evening. If you are not familiar with us, we have lots of great author events coming up, um, lots of really great historical stuff too. Uh, early February, we're going to be doing an event with Polis Publishers um, and uh, Agora, which is another imprint. That one's going to be on February 9th, where we'll have four of their authors. Um, I think if you are fans of Hillary's, you will definitely enjoy that. Uh, as far as historical fiction goes, um, we have uh, Deanna Rayburn, Lorna Willig, and Tasha Alexander coming up early um, in March. And I'm sure uh, we don't have it quite confirmed yet, but I'm sure when Susan's new um, Maggie Hope book comes out, we will definitely do something for her because we were huge fans of those in the store. Uh, so I'm gonna get them introduced and bring them on, but I also wanted to mention if you uh, have questions for either author while they're chatting, you can drop those in the comments, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll be collecting those and we'll leave some time at the end for some crowd questions. So we're really excited tonight, like I said, to have Hillary Davidson with us. Uh, she has been re-releasing um, her books from her previous series um and so she is let me find my bio here uh hillary davidson was a journalist before she turned to the dark side and started writing crime fiction her novels include the lily moore series the damage done the next one to fall and evil in all its disguises the shadows of new york series one small sacrifice and don't look down and the standalone novels blood always tells and her last breath she is also the author of some 50 short stories. A few of the earliest have been gathered in a collection called The Black Widow Club. Her fiction has won two Anthony Awards, a Derringer Award, and a host of other accolades. Toronto born and raised, she moved to New York City in October of 2001 because of her very persuasive husband, Daniel. She is the, also the author of um, 18 nonfiction books. Let's bring her in. How are you tonight, Hillary? Oh, good, thank you. And so happy to be joining you here. It's crazy to me that you have written that many books because like I remember you coming to the store for the first one. It just doesn't seem like there have been that many since then, but I guess there have. I know. It, it is hard to believe because the time has passed really quickly. I mean, I think everything except quarantine year yeah. in the last year has passed really fast. And so yeah. um, it, it's been strange. Like my first fiction, uh, you know, first novels came out in 2010. And it's it's funny. It's like with the short stories, you kind of forget about what you've written. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it's been a little bit of a strange um, process <laughs> to sort of be bringing the books back because they were out of Print for a little while and I realized like oh a lot of people only know the last two books that I wrote and of course like you knew me from way back when but mm -hmm. it's just sort of interesting like the different entry points that people have for your work so yeah it's been a funny time. And we're so excited tonight to have uh, Susan Alaya McNeil with us. She's going to be chatting with Hillary. Um, as I mentioned, she is the author of the Maggie Hope books. Uh, she's a New York Times, uh, Washington Post, and USA Today bestselling author of the Maggie Hope Mystery Series. She's won the Barry Award and has been nominated for the Edgar McCavity Agatha Left Coast Crime Dillis and ITW Thriller Awards. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and son. Let's bring her in. How are you tonight, Susan? Hi. Hi. I'm so, so excited, Hillary. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited to be. Case, but um, Hillary and I are friends in real life, so this yeah. is just a treat. This is we delightful. we also have a fan club in real life too, because I am a huge fan of Susan's oh. and. Well, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Lily, and I'm so excited that Lily's <laughs> like having a comeback. So, um, should we just? Start? Yeah, so uh, just to reiterate again, if anybody's come in since we got started, if you have questions for Hillary or Susan during the chat, please feel free to post those in the, uh, this is my cat's knocking stuff off of a table back there. Um, so uh, please feel free to post them in the comments on either Facebook or YouTube, whichever way you were watching, and we will leave a little bit of time at the end. So I'm going to pop away and let these two chat, and I will see you guys in just a little bit. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. It's amazing. All right, Hillary. <laughs> I am so thrilled about this. Um, so first of all, I met Lily Moore when I met you about 10, 12 years ago. 
Yeah, I guess like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do guess remember, I say, remember the first book because um, Lily had to come back from Spain, and then I really remember the second book because of Peru and yes. Machu Picchu. So yes. I'm so delighted. I love all your books, and I followed your whole like the last decade of your writing. But I'm so happy like Lily's back in print, and I just wanted to ask you a little something about that because yes. what was that journey like for you, and what made you decide to? bring Lily back yourself instead of selling the light? Yeah, so this is actually such a great question because um, I know so many writers who've sort of um, gone through something like the process that I have where you have books that come out and it's always very exciting, you know, when you have books out. Um, but then a few years go by and they're not really available in print anymore. They're always available in eBooks, of course. Um, but I, you know, I realized that with Lily and I actually um, went to my former publisher, Tor Forge, and asked them for the rights back. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from different people that it can be like quite a tough negotiation. Um, but Tor Forge was actually really lovely. It took a long time. It took about a year and a half to actually get wow. the rights back. Uh, so it, it was certainly a process, but uh, they were wonderful about it and basically gave me the rights back to my first four books. So the three Lily books and a standalone that I wrote. And it was funny after that because, you know, I said to my agent, like, you know, I really want to get the books back in print. I'm really eager to do that. And um, so he, you know, he talked to some different people. And when I was looking at contracts, I basically felt like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be sort of signing away the rights to the books again. And it'll kind of be forever this time because when you're selling reprint right like that, you're never going to get it back. And I just, I, I really felt like I'd like to sort of control the rights myself. And I yes. will say there was a certain amount of innocence because I had no idea what I was getting into. And I really thought uh, basically, oh, well, it'll be tough, like tough getting a cover designer. I don't know how to choose that, but everything else will be fine. And it was funny, it was the opposite. I actually had a really easy time finding a cover designer and everything else about the process was absolutely crazy um, because you, you end up becoming your own publisher. So I felt like, well, of course I'm the author, I have the books, um, how hard can it be? And it was like, I've never formatted a book for publication before. It was like a, a whole other thing <laughs> to go All through the technical the stuff. page by page on the technical stuff. And then, um, you know, if you're publishing things yourself, you need to get IS, like buy ISBNs and register them and sort of go through. I ended up, um, because I really wanted the books to come back in, you know, paperback form as well as eBooks. Um, so it, it meant um, going through Ingram, which is a you know, really interesting company, but like a very old school kind of company. And so it was a matter of learning everybody's different system to bring them back because Amazon has one system for eBooks, Apple has another, Kobo has another, and then Ingram has its whole other system for paperbacks. So it wasn't even just formatting once, it was formatting four times for each book. And so, yeah, I, I wow. set this goal for myself of I'm going to get these three books out in three months. And all I can say is to anyone else watching, don't do that. Like, that's a mistake. You really don't want to make my mistake. But now that um, now that I've done it, I you know, I feel like thrilled. And, you know, we, we had talked about doing a toast to Lily. Oh, so yeah. I've got my, my French 75 ready here. Um, so satisfying having done it, but um, a little crazy. And just for any writers in the audience, anyone in the same boat, um, I am more than happy to give advice if somebody's thinking of doing the same thing, bringing the books back into print. Um, I'm, I am glad I did it. It's just so much more work than I ever could have imagined. Well, but here's cheers. to you. Here's to Lily Moore. <laughs> Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. Cheers. Yay. <laughs> cheers. So I love Lily so much. She's so oh. strong and cool. And she's got this like retro vintage vibe going on. And I just, I was wondering, like, how did she come to you? I know you worked in travel journalism, you were a travel writer. She's a travel writer. But what other, how, how did she come to be? And then maybe are there similarities with you? 
Oh, yeah. So um, it's always embarrassing being an adult talking about your imaginary friends, but that was definitely. <laughs> well, we do. For me. We do. We all do. We do right? living, you know, you know and, and Lily had a very um, kind of interesting genesis. So, you know, I was a travel writer for a decade and I was, you know, writing guidebooks for Fromers and I was the honeymoon columnist for Martha Stewart Weddings. And I had this wow. sort of, you know, fun job, like this fun gig running around and especially a lot of honeymoon themed travel, which is romantic but I was traveling by myself most of the time and when you're a travel writer you are on the road by yourself most of the time that's the yeah. norm and it was really funny though because I did do this one press trip um, that was just a group of female journalists and we were all like sitting around dinner one night and started talking having actually like a really personal conversation about people's reasons for doing the work that they did. And for me, it had always been like a love of travel, just this desire to see the entire world. Yeah. But, um, you know, every everyone else actually had a really interesting story about like one person, there was like a sort of marriage she was trying to get away from and it sort of only worked when she was away from home. And people had sort of issues they were, you know, trying to get away from and time on the road, let them do that. And I remember like coming away from that and kind of thinking about what it would be like to sort of to be that person, to have so much drama at home that life on the road is actually easier to cope with. Um, and Lily was kind of born out of that. Um, so mm -hmm. I would say that in personal life terms, it's the opposite because um, my husband and I celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary I last know, year. And thank you. The, the, honestly, like the tough thing has always been, you know, because of course he, he's come with me on trips sometimes, but um, a lot of trips, you know, he's missed out on because unless you're also a travel journalist, you can't yeah. do that. And uh, so, you know, kind of, I've been lonely traveling, you know, lots of the time, but there definitely are similarities. And I started, I guess, thinking about Lily as like, what is she escaping from? And before she traveled, how did she escape? And that's like how some very personal stuff ended up in the book because mm -hmm. Lily has this love, you sort of mentioned uh, sort of the vintage feel of the books mm -hmm. and Lily has this love of classic Hollywood movies and all things vintage and um, sort of an, an aesthetic that um, yeah, I compare her in the book to Ava Gardner. That's sort of her yeah. frame of reference. And it was funny because I started writing the character and I did some research about Ava Gardner at the same time. And um, I had given Lily this sort of very sad backstory about her dad dying when she was 13. And that had happened to Ava Gardner. And that you know her father had died when she was 13. And so it was weird. I, I kind of sort of leaned more almost in, I think, to the the Ava Gardner side of things when I realized that, because it felt a little bit faded. Um, yeah, and I was actually- It's like that. Yeah, and I got like a, like a postcard of Ava Gardner, like a gorgeous um, black and white photo that I would keep on my desk while writing just to sort of channel Lily. But it was funny because there was this personal sense too where I had grown up, like my grandmother often you know babysat me and my grandmother loved old movies and her favorite um, actress was Barbara Stanwyck. Her favorite actor was Tyrone Power, who is someone that Ty Lily has a huge crush on. <laughs> and um, it was just sort of like little details like that worked their way into the book. And certainly like, I love vintage. Um, my, my first job when I was a teenager was actually working for a vintage clothing store. And I just, I've always loved all things vintage. So there's definitely connection there. I love how in all your books, but particularly in the Lily books, um, perfume and vintage perfume is so important. And I was just wondering if you could just say a little bit about that because I love that kind of detail. Oh, and it's so good because you never know what's going to resonate with people. So the very first time that I um, went on a trip by myself, I was 19 and I went to Paris and my grandmother was so excited for me to go. Um, she'd never been to Paris, um, but she had worn a perfume called um, like Soir de Paris that was 
out of circulation for years that they had stopped making. But uh, I said, I'm going to look for that perfume for you in Paris. And of course, it, they hadn't brought it back, but it led me to sort of all sorts of interesting places. Um, but it was funny because it also made me realize that there's this kind of scent memory that people have, and maybe some people more strongly than others. But for me, I really um, react to that. And I know my grandmother did too, because she, you know, she had these wonderful memories of, oh, the first time I wore it, you know, this sort of like wonderful yeah. evening. And it was just, it's really funny because it triggers so much. And so I think that's like another area of overlap where kind of intuitively, I um, take in, you know, the world that way. Scent is really important. It is for Lily too. And it, it definitely, mm -hmm. um, you know, is something that brings her back. There were a lot of um, like flashbacks in the books to, um, you know, things that have happened, sometimes her childhood and different things. And sometimes it's like a scent memory that that'll bring that up. So it ends up being kind of an important factor in the books. I hear it's really the scent um, and sense of smell is really linked to your emotions. I think that's Very true. Very in your brain. Uh, yeah, I, I like, read that too. That And kind of intuitively that feels true right that you sort yeah. of you smell something it brings back memories but it's it's not just that you remember oh yeah that scent is familiar it's like you remember that day who you were with like a whole you know a whole set of memories around the scent absolutely so one of the things i love 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 about lily is she is not a static character she changes over the course of the books and we get to go along that journey with her and i was just wondering what made you decide to have her be like an evolving character and what was that like like taking her through this journey right so i mean i'm you know a fan of the, any number of different mystery series um some of which you know the the character changes and evolves quite right. a bit like you know sarah paretsky's vi warshawski um series where that you know there's always sort of some evolution that happens with the character but you know i grew up with nancy drew books where oh, you know 70 so 70 books in she's still you know a titian haired 18 year old driving a convertible and you know it, it's not Nothing has changed. Um, but I felt, I think, with Lily, when I started writing the books, there were a lot of changes going on in um, media and in travel writing um, in particular. And it was funny because it was very much on my mind, like, I've really enjoyed doing this, but what am I going to do next? And I think with Lily, there's the sense of um, she spent a lot of time working on what she would consider um, forgettable stories, stories that mm -hmm. maybe they help someone plan a trip, maybe they help for, you know, the next year or something, but places change and evolve. And you can't yeah. go back and read a travel story from, you know, 10 or 20 years ago as anything other than an artifact, because things are always in motion and changing. And so I think because of the experiences that she goes through, sort of like very dark experiences that she does have, it sort of makes her want to use her experience in a different way. So that um, by the time you get to the third book, she's sort of starting off on a press trip, um, you know, not enjoying it, realizing all the things she doesn't like, but it actually leads her to a much more serious story and serious issue that she ends up covering in the end. So mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, part of it is is like looking for meaning almost, you know, like how do you actually, um, how do you contribute? Like how do you sort of do something that you love while also making a difference? So I, I think for her, that's maybe, she starts off running away from things and by the third book, she starts running towards danger yeah. rather than mm -hmm. sort of always having this instinct to flee. That's probably her Achilles heel, I would say, when, you know, when you read The Damage Done, I would say that that would probably be her worst trait in that book, that she sort of always run away from conflict, um, doesn't really address things directly. Well, I was just wondering, since you did work as a travel writer and since you did travel on your own to such like far flung locales, um, did you ever find yourself scared or did you ever think like you could be the victim of a crime or like did that ever um, sort of 
push you towards writing about crime and murder and thrillers and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, it was actually one of the strangest things about travel writing was that, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that the business was like this 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but as the number of sort of pages shrunk and it became more ad dependent, mm -hmm. you couldn't write anything negative about a mm -hmm. destination no matter what happened to you there? And so, you know, I've had experiences traveling where um, you've been like robbed or attacked or, um, you know, there's been something like that where you want to give people, you know, a sense of proportion. You, you want them to travel. You want them also, though, to be aware that there can be dangers. And it got to the point where literally couldn't like say any kind of negative word in a story. And in particular, I did a press trip to Easter Island, which was a huge highlight of my life. I'd always wow. wanted to go. But the tour operator actually tried to extort money out of the journalists mm -hmm. while we were there. Um, and we were like fish in a barrel because there was no other option. You're like trapped in this place. Like once you're there, it, it was crazy. It was like they were trying to extort money out of us to visit like the key sites. And these were the places that were on our itinerary to see. And so my reaction was, wow, if they're willing to do that to travel journalists who they know are going to be writing about them, you know, what would they do to a regular traveler? So I did put a mention of this in my story. And, um, you know, it, it was just like pulled right out. You know, it, there was there was no way that was going in. Yeah. And so I, I, it was really a reaction, I think, maybe to experiences like that, where um, I wanted a place to talk about the dark side of travel, not to ever scare people off. I mean, in spite of anything that's happened to me, I still love travel, still want to see the world. This past year has been really hard because oh, I've oh, not God. gone anywhere, obviously. I mean, hard for many reasons, but that's sort of like one of the, the things that when you normally have the freedom to travel, it's um, it really shrinks your world to not do that. But there's also this awareness, and even working for Fromers, um, there was an editor that we had there, a wonderful um, woman named Claudia Kirsok, who went missing on a press trip, um, and who's never been found. Her parents, she, um, she was supposed to go to Cuba and was denied entry, and um, there was sort of a strange series of events where the chain that was supposed to be the host, basically, she was one of several journalists that was refused entry. Uh, this was going back, my goodness, this is like mm, early aughts, um, maybe 2001, 2002. Um, and so they were offered different places they could go to in the Caribbean instead. And she went missing. She and another journalist were at a resort. Um, and I don't remember exactly the location, but it was in Jamaica and she just vanished. Her parents had um, hired private investigators. They've worked with the police, but it's like a really awful story that kind of always stayed with me because, you know, she's a very smart, savvy journalist, you know, traveling, not even alone. Like there was another journalist she was with at the hotel. And so that always stayed with me traveling, even in the most beautiful place. There's that sort of sense that, um, it, it's not that it's necessarily dangerous, but you're not at your best when you travel. You might be jet lagged, you might be disoriented, maybe you don't speak the language. You're just out of your element and that just makes you inherently vulnerable. So that always kind of, I guess, has stayed with me. So love of travel, but at the same time, realizing that sort of like edge of, of dark possibility in it. So speaking of love of travel, um, tell me about your favorite places that you went and then how you sort of integrated that into your books. Because um, I'm guessing that Peru <laughs> was a big favorite because you just described it so beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that is, thank you. Um, I am I am very glad that-, that and I've always wanted to go there. So at least I've been there through oh, your book. Yeah, it honestly, I think um, I've been so lucky to visit so many different places, but Peru, stands out for me as you know the sort of the most exceptional in every way and it just sort of hit all the sweet spots for the things mm -hmm. that i love so i am an archaeology nerd from way back and so i love ruins and you know love the sort of um history and of course it has that in just 
spades, you know, amazing um, Inca sites that you can visit, some that are perfectly preserved, um, just gorgeous, but amazing food, like some of the best food that I've ever had in my life. Um, amazing animals. So if you're sort of into nature, you know, the Colca Canyon is like twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. And, oh, oh, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, like it's just, it's this land of wonders. You have, um, you know, mountains, you have the sea, you have uh, such a, a rich, lush, territory and it, it really was um a place where like you just you know people there like want to teach you about the place so i ended up meeting so many interesting people when i was there so i just loved it in every way and yeah i think i really wanted to um kind of replicate that in the next one to fall I felt very guilty killing someone at Machu Picchu. <laughs> I will say that um, I kind of realized after I finished writing the book, I would have to tell my contacts at the Peruvian tourism board that I had killed someone at their most famous site. And uh, it turned out to be fine. I gave them a copy of the book and uh, they ended up ordering a bunch, like hundreds of them um, to give away at trade shows. And I actually like went back and I was like, so, hey, did you actually read the book that I wrote because someone, I killed someone at Machu Picchu? And she said, that's okay. It wasn't a Peruvian person who killed them. So they were fine with it. They had no problem That's actually all. pretty funny. And I can understand <laughs> that way of thinking. Like, I, I get that. Like, I can well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, if I were writing books that said, oh, don't go to this, you know, don't go to Mexico. A Mexican person might kill you. Don't go to Peru. A Peruvian person might kill you. Like, that's crazy. Who, who would want to read that? But the idea is almost that people bring their baggage from home. And that includes emotional baggage and these different you know different things so any situation that um, turns dark it's usually because of something trailing behind them like that not because you know someone pickpocketed them in a you know in the cathedral or something like that's right. really you're, you're not at huge risk of you know violent crime or something with these places most of the time um, but yeah, so when I wrote the book, I really wanted to use um, real settings. There's like, a, I think a private villa near the end of the book and a couple of other private homes that appear in the book that are fictional. Everything else was um, real, whether, you know, talking about what it was like at Machu Picchu or in the town um, of Cusco, uh, the different sites there, or in Lima where the book ends up. It was like, I just, I really wanted to bring it to life because I think that is a place that's on a lot of people's bucket lists. Yes. And I really wanted, like you said, like it's a place like you'd love to visit. There's just, there's so much there to see. Um, uh, but it's it's not always the easiest place to to visit either, and especially now that they're, for very good reasons, limiting how many people can go to Machu Picchu in a day, and that it's it's not easy to organize. So yeah, I really wanted to give people this sort of um, this experience of traveling vicariously. So many places that I've been ended up being lucky enough to go to, I've sort of met first in fiction, and so I I kind of wanted to create that experience for people. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful experience to be able to travel by book and you do it so well. Um, so tell me, because this is like one of my favorite things about the series is tell me a little bit more about Lily and her love of vintage and her love of old movies. And how did that work its way into the books? So it, um, I, th I felt, I think, very self-conscious at first because I was thinking of it like, oh my goodness, these are reference points for Lily. Um, but they're not reference points for, you know, other people. So, right. you know, she'll see someone and uh, there's a character she encounters in, you know, in the first book, this person reminds her, you know, of a certain actress, reminds her of Grace Kelly or someone else, her ex um, fiance reminds her of Tyrone Power with whom she's a tremendous crush. Her best friend, Jesse looks like Gregory Peck. And so I felt a little bit like, um, is anybody else really going to get these references? Like, is this going to have um, resonance with people? But I think because, I mean, those are like very big names. I think if you say, you know, Grace Kelly, most people have some Absolutely. kind of image in their head of, you know, what she looks like. I tried not to go too obscure with things. And I tried to work in things like music because I found that even if people had never, you know, 
watched an old movie, they knew songs of Billie Holiday's or Sarah Vaughn's. Like there are things like that that have lived on. And so it started out a little bit as just movies and then expanded into these other sort of classic vintage things because like quite honestly, um, I had watched some of these movies way back and I remembered some scenes in them, but I had to go back and rewatch things to be able to, you know, write about it, just have like a, an off the cuff kind of line. Um, you know, it, it was like, I needed to ground myself in that because these are very like looming large in Lily's mind. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it was sort of, I guess, part of getting to know the character because, as I did that, it sort of let me more into her world. Um, and I realized like part of her story, you know, in writing this, she was, she grew up sort of in a troubled home. I mentioned that her father passed away when she was 13. Right. And there was this sort of sense, her mother kept up rooting her and her sister and moving them to different towns. And so these, um, movie characters were basically her friends, like her imaginary friends. Yeah. And I realized like in writing that, people didn't necessarily need to identify with the movie or the character. It was sort of a relatable idea that whether you find your imaginary friends in a book or whatever it is, like when you're alone, you know, I think a lot of people draw on something like that. So it was sort of taking this thing that was personal to her and trying to expand it and make it a little bit bigger so other people would relate to it too. Absolutely. And that is something that you really like too, right? Oh, love. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. It, it was almost, uh, the temptation honestly was, um, you know, going way back actually when I was in high school, I, I just had this weird obsession. I loved Rita Hayworth and I used to draw portraits of Hollywood wow. stars mm -hmm. and we had art shows at schools and um, a few of them even sold. Like there was one wow. I did of like Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor. And these were just from like old studio portraits that were really dramatic. But I realized like I didn't just want to put in sort of the things that I love. Once I had that connection between Lily and Ava Gardner, I kind of went hard in that direction. And, um, you know, Ava Gardner is someone who, you know, I absolutely oh. loved her movies and yeah, me too. all of that. But it was a great excuse to go back and rewatch them and <laughs> put some of, um, she, she was just such a dramatic character that as Lily, I think, gets a bit more confrontational and deals with things. It's almost like she realizes herself she's channeling Ava because Ava was no shrinking violet. She was a very, um, you know, strong, powerful woman. And uh, I think almost it becomes like a little bit of a touchstone and a source of strength, like for someone who, didn't have a great role model growing up that this is sort of what she draws from. Absolutely. And Ava Gardner, I mean, what a spitfire. I mean, oh, goodness. Right. And there so was this great, ridiculous yeah, thing. <laughs> this sounds terrible. So this is a little bit spoilery, but in um, in the first book, near the end of the book, there is someone that Lily has kind of a physical confrontation with. And um, she slaps this person in the face so hard that this other person loses a tooth, which apparently is something that happened with um, Ava Gardner and one of her boyfriends at one point. So oh my goodness. <laughs> it was like inspired by reading an Ava Gardner biography, actually. Well, that whole set of them, you know, Frank Sinatra and all of those, you know, they, they lived large, shall we say? Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It was, uh, that's true. That honestly, I think it's one of the most um, alluring things is that when we think about even even going back like a few decades like that, we think of people as being so different. Like, oh, they were so formal. You know, everybody was wearing a hat back then. Like, hey, right. we're formal. No, they they were yeah. nuts and crazy, and you know, doing these crazy things just like anybody might be doing today. And you know, it's, it's humans have not changed that much. The style changes, but you realize like people have not actually changed that much. But there was so. no internet. So people think- No, no social media. There, it Actually the, the only fear then were the gossip columnists, which, you know, um, Hedda Hopper and Luella yeah. Parsons. And apparently there's this wild story about um, Ava Gardner's first date with Frank Sinatra, where apparently he brought a gun with him and shot it like in the middle of town and like wreaked some havoc. And the whole story had to be quieted down. He didn't shoot any people to be cleared, but this what? was like a drunken, yeah, like no humans were harmed, but some kind of crazy joyride. Oh, and, 
Oh yeah. It's like things like that. Like, man, I, it, it's a little over the top actually, even for fiction, like a little too crazy. All I remember, I, there's this quote. I remember Frank Sinatra supposedly said that when um, he married Mia Farrow, that Ava Gardner said, Oh, Frank, finally you're with a young boy. I just thought that was so bitchy. Yes. This God. bitchy, snarky, that exactly. Yes. Like that was a, such a notorious sort of, yeah. Like always do you'd end up with a young boy. Yeah. <laughs> so going back to Lily though. So, okay. So three books coming out and yeah. what is next for Miss Moore? Oh my goodness. So um, this is sort of a tough question in a way, because when I did these three books, I have to say, I'm not someone who outlines in advance, but I know a lot about the arc of the character and kind of where the character is going even if I don't know the plot details. And so there, um, there were these little things that I seeded into the book, starting with the first book, that were meant to go into another set of three books that sort of like move ahead with Lily a little bit. And a couple of people have written actually noticing a couple of things. They put together some puzzle pieces and made very close to correct guesses about where some stuff was going. Um, so I guess part of it is that I think of it like I would love to go back and write them. And just because I'm 10 years on from when the first book came out or going on 11 years actually now, because it came out in 2010, um, Lily does not have to be, you know, whenever I actually sit down to do that. And I, I think I will actually at some point. Um, Lily does not have to be 10 years on or, you know, 12 years on. Or, I mean, yeah, that's really fascinating. I mean, if I, oh, she could. That's true. That yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I've had her with me traveling at other in other places and to the point where a couple of times I've written short stories with her in them and have taken them out, you know, just sort of not being sure if I wanted to sort of have the character sort of in that format, but right. I miss her and I miss writing about her and sort of the process of bringing these books back made me sort of go into them like in great detail. And I really felt like I miss Lily. I miss Jesse. I had left certain things in the book. Um, you know, some people have read the, the second book, the next one to fall might remember a name of, of a character called Charlie Cutler, who Jesse becomes very close to. And I certainly had plans for, you know, return of characters. So there, there are some things like that, that I feel it's that trilogy resolves, I think pretty well in the third book, but that there's a lot more that, that I could do. So I actually have sort of been hoping that with these books coming out and mm -hmm. like the, the third one literally just came out like uh, three weeks ago or, or four weeks ago at the end of very end of December, kind of interested to see the reaction that they get. And if, you know, if people are actually interested in seeing more about Lily and Jesse and, you know, the world that they inhabit. So I'm sort of curious to see, you know, how that goes. Well, I can just say I would love more Lily. Oh, so, think about that. And I, I wouldn't mind if she were like 10 years older. I think that would be kind of, <gasps> but you know, um, so yeah. you have a very full dance card beyond Lily and getting Lily back into print and you've done standalones and you've also done another series, which I'll, I also love. So what, what's that like, like traveling into different series and doing standalones? Like, well, first of all, what do you like better series or standalones and, and why? Oh gosh, you know, it, it's so tough to pick because they, they each have their own set of virtues. So one of the things that I loved about writing Lily was that by the time I got to the third book, I knew her so well that um, it was it was like being with a friend. You know, even though terrible things are happening and she's at this hotel where a journalist has gone missing and, you know, she ends up trapped in this place and, you know, things are bad in her world. But there was something really wonderful about sort of being with this character that yeah. I know so well. And also because it's a serious character, quite honestly, I feel like there's this kind of, uh, yeah, I feel like you, you probably have feelings about this too, writing about Maggie Hope. There's a pact with the reader. You're not going to shock the reader by, you know, doing something terrible like 
Lily is always going to be in the books. <laughs> like that's not, you know, not going to change. And you can trust that Jesse, you know, her best friend is going to be there too. Um, you know, there, so there's this comfort in that, but then the allure of the standalone is that anything can happen and yeah. all bets are off, right? And so, I, and you, I mean, you have been writing, I love your Maggie Hope series so much. And for anybody watching this, if you haven't picked up these books, yeah. they're set in World War II and just amazing, amazing, amazing. But I have to ask you, because I know you've been writing your first standalone. And after being with sort of, <laughs> one character through so many books. I kind of wonder what that was like for you. Because for me, it was um, like wonderful, but also I felt like I was stepping out without a tightrope under me. Definitely. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm feeling that now and I'm not even all that far. But one of the first things I did was um, that the new book that I'm doing, which is Untitled and a standalone, um, there are two female lead characters. It's a mother-daughter team. And for the daughter, just because she's so close in age to Maggie, I actually did a list of like all the ways they were dissimilar just uh -huh. because I wanted to really um, delineate like exactly who was who. So like Maggie's very mathy and this new character um, is very much into like books and reading and writing and wants to be a journalist and you know so they have some similarities like they have a lot of drive and they have they're very smart and they're they're very strong women but they're they're really different in terms of like how they deal with the world right. and also backgrounds so that must have been something that you did so with your other series you have a duo a, a police Duo. Right. So yeah, that's a, a pair of no different from Lily. Yeah. Ex well, yeah. So different from Lillian's in some ways. And then, like, you know, there there are there's overlap, there's similarities, but the books were written in a really different style. So the Lily books are told they're in the first person. Mm -hmm. It's just Lily's point of view. And then the Shadows of New York series. Don't ask me why I decided to do them this way. I clearly did not know what I was getting into. But I decided that I wanted to tell the story from multiple perspectives. And so while you do have these two NYPD detectives, I also wanted to have uh, the point of view of the main suspect be mm -hmm. uh, like a, a major presence and ends up being like one of the main characters in, in the books. Um, and, um, and then also to have sort of other key characters. So um, one small sacrifice has four points of view. There's only one point of view that returns for uh, Don't Look Down, the second book in the series. So it was a little bit, I think, like I was trying to get the best of both worlds because I was writing about this detective duo. Um, you know, they're in both books, but every other perspective is different. And so it was a little bit like, well, with these other characters you haven't met before, it is like a standalone and anything could happen to them. So I think I was trying to have it both ways, actually, with series and standalone. But um, I will say that the challenge of trying to write four characters, um, sort of having them in sync, having sort of what needs to happen in the book, um, mm -hmm. you know, happen with each, oh, it was like, I felt like I was building a clock. <laughs> Like that was just quite yeah, yeah. Like that was really um yeah, that that was just sort of an unexpected challenge, I think. I loved writing from different perspectives, and my new book that's coming out in July um is called Her Last Breath. And in a way, it it goes back a little bit to the style of the Lily books, the very different main character, but it's um, a young woman who's telling you things from her point of view. Um, you know, her sister has just died mm -hmm. and she gets a message from her sister that was set to go out if she died. Um, and so in a way it was like going back to that sort of narrative where you really seeped in one character. Spoiler alert, there ends up being a, a second narrator in the book as Ooh. well that you, as you go through, and you, you get in select chapters. But um, it was really nice, actually, to sort of to go wow. back and like live inside the head of, of one character and really just sort of know that person so well. So, you know, I... I think maybe because of writing short stories, I love kind of approaching them in different ways and yeah. having different characters and playing with first person and third person and kind of different styles of 
narration. I don't know. I guess I always feel like I'm kind of playing a game of what if when I'm doing what I'm doing. And sometimes the trick is really figuring out the best way to tell a story. And it isn't always like the way that I start out, you know, with a book or with a short story. But isn't that the fun part? Oh, it is. Like when that actually happens organically, that's so cool. It, it's, so, it's funny too, because I don't know, I, I spend a lot of my time like hitting my head against the desk saying, why am I doing this? But mm -hmm. then when it starts working, it is the best feeling in the world. And you right. just feel, though for me, that's usually, I, I do a first draft and it's terrible and I do a second draft and it's terrible. And then when I get into draft three, it's like the sweet spot. Like suddenly Ooh. it's like, this is where things are actually working. And nobody sees my books, like my agent, my editor, nobody sees them until after draft three. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, it usually, I think, takes me like that long to really sort of figure out what I, like what I want to do maybe with the story. I think the way that I approach it is usually through character. And mm -hmm. it means that I've got like plot holes when I start writing the story that I have to figure out sort of as I go along. So that's like the challenge for me. It's like knowing the character, but not having like, you know, the the thorough understanding of the story. I don't know for okay. you, like, it, it, I mean, has it changed? I know with you, it's like you're tied into historical events. And so you have this sort of amazing world of some real life characters, some real life events, like things like that. Like I've learned history from reading your books, like all kinds of things that I did not know about World War II. Um, so for you, how much of it is sort of, you're obviously guided by history, but then, you're also inventing things as you go along. How do you balance that? You know, again, I think it goes back to character. So, you know, like, you know, if you, if you set a book, say, you know, my new book, The Hollywood Spy coming out in July um, is set in Los Angeles in 1943. And, you know, you, you, you have to go by characters, you know, Maggie's in a very dark spot when we leave her in the King's Justice. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, getting better in the sunshine of Los Angeles. Um, but it was interesting because researching 1943 in Los Angeles, um, you know, it seems like it would be this time when America was all like gung ho, like let's work together, let's fight the common enemies. And it really wasn't. There was like the zoot suit riots, there were race riots, um, there were all kinds of crazy things happening that, you know, history, history like blows over. So it was a little um, weird and, um, disquieting for me to be researching and writing about all of that this past summer where right. the summer of 2020 had so many parallels to the summer of 1943. So it just, um, it's history, but you always, you know, you, there's the official version and then there's like what you, what you get when you dig a little deeper. So. Right. Um, yeah. And that's, that's fascinating to me. The idea that sort of history, because it elides over so many things, right. Yeah. And the idea is that these things happen. And you feel like, oh, well, you know, people must have been in agreement. They must have been closer on the issues. But I remember, so back, you know, actually as a teenager, when I was drawing those portraits of film stars, um, there was a like a secondhand magazine and bookstore that was near my high school that used to sell old copies of magazines. And I remember getting like for next to nothing, old copies of Look magazine. And I was always fascinated by these Partly, though, because you would read letters to the editor and like, you know, even in World War Two, people were writing to the editor about that nasty profile you wrote about Mr. Hitler. He's truly a great man and America, you know, should. And it, it's sort of mind blowing. You don't think of Americans. Well, it didn't make it into any of the to... propaganda. You know, it didn't no, make it into the no. right But you think like, oh, my goodness, like people who you know, reading this magazine, getting offended by this negative portrayal of Hitler. The, the history elides over a lot, like the sort of the version that people yeah. tell later, right? Like that's sort yeah. of, so, yeah, I think you see that over and over. So yeah, that, that is fascinating. Well, I just wanted to check in with John and just see if there were any uh, questions maybe from the audience. So. Hey, so yeah, so we do have a few. Um, I had one to start with. So Hillary, as you were going back and reformatting these books, were, how did you resist the temptation to potentially maybe go back and tweak things? Or did you resist it? Did you change anything? 
So the one thing that I changed in the damage done was that, and this was a copy editing thing. I used to be a copy editor many, many, many moons ago. And when the book came out, email was spelled with a hyphen and it just drove me bananas. Like there were a few, you know, that was sort of, it came up so often, you know, someone sending a message via E hyphen mail. And I, I actually wrote an author's note at the beginning because it was basically like, you know, nothing in the book has changed except that. <laughs> <laughs> and that because honestly, the, the main temptation, I think, was from a technology point of view, because when I was writing that book, that was written in 2008 and to that early 2009. And, you know, technology is so different. Um, and you realize, like, you know, I talk about there's like a DVD player and these mm -hmm. sort of things that people don't really have anymore. They have Netflix. And I remember at the beginning being so tempted thinking, you know, maybe I should take these references out. And then I thought, like, it's just, it's authentic to the book. You know, I, I do point out, like, it. Yeah, it was published, you know, 2010, you know, this was a thing then. Um, and so aside from like changing, there were some uh, typographical things, like emails, the one that stands in my mind that I did change, that I just left the rest as it was because I honestly felt it would be like pulling a thread on a sweater, that if I started doing that, that I, there would be no end of things. And then it you would know, end up being a different book. And so I, I just sort of left it alone. It was a little bit tempting with the next one to fall because there's been enough that's changed with um, travel to Peru. Um, but again, it was like, I felt like I was giving people a reliable accounting of what it had been like at a certain period in time. And so I ended up leaving it alone. So yeah, so basically I um, definitely, there were copy editing things that I fixed, but that was it for, for changing the books. Yeah, I, I, you know, I love it when you go back and you read something that was written, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I was uh, talking on another event. I've been rereading these Leslie Meyer uh, cozies that like the first one started in like 1991. And like in the fourth or fifth book in the series, like she started, she's a journalist and like in the fourth or fifth book, her kids are like, you know, there's this new thing called the internet. Let's teach you how to use the internet. And it's so funny just to watch like from the beginning where she has to like call people and go to the library to do stuff. And then you start to see, so I love being able to read stuff that, that reads not dated, but in a way that you're like, Oh yeah, that's how things used to be. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you feel that way. Cause that was what I told myself too, that people would sort of, they would get that the book wasn't, I don't know if you guys saw, there was a review circulating on, I want to say Facebook and Twitter for a while where someone was really angry. It was a book that came out this year and the, the reader was angry that the author hadn't put the pandemic in the book. And everyone yeah. in the industry yeah. was saying, you know, this book was written before the pandemic. Like if it was published this year, it was written at least a year or two ago. But like really you get like outraged, you know, readers that, um, you know, say things like that. And I don't know sort of what they're expecting, but you try to reflect reality as much as you can, but there are limits. <laughs> Uh, so, Susan, uh, Jenny wants to know, can you tell us what era your standalone is set in? Ooh, um, yeah. So it's still World War II, but it's a Homefront novel. And it's set in Los Angeles in the late 30s into the early 40s. And I'm focusing on a mother-daughter team um, who are based on a real-life mother-daughter team who um, became spies and infiltrated some of the American Nazi groups that were so prevalent in, in LA, especially because um, Hitler actually wanted to set up an, an LA, a West Coast sort of um, place for himself. And there was a lot of fascism and there was a lot of support for that, um, both both Germans um, and also Americans. So uh, I, I found this while I was researching The Hollywood Spy and I just thought they were these women, um, their real names are Sylvia and Grace Comfort. And <clears throat> they were really a footnote to a footnote of history. And I just thought they were so cool and their story could be so interesting. So that's amazing. I mean, yeah, I know you said yeah. you're still working on it, but like, I want to read it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And uh, so, and I also wanted to mention, uh, Pamela mentioned in the comments that she was late for the event. So if you guys tuned in late, don't worry. As soon as we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive the video so you'll be able to find it. And while you're searching around, there's over 200 author events on both the Facebook and YouTube. So definitely poke around and see what else you can find. But if you missed the beginning of it, you'll be able to catch a replay before long. Um, so both Lindsay and Leanne want to know, what have y'all been reading lately? Um, what's just some stuff that you read for pleasure and enjoy? Let's start with Hillary. Oh, wow. So um, there have been so many good books I've read lately. And I actually took a week off between Christmas and New Year's. Um, I gave myself this sort of like time where I'm just not going to do any work and I'm just going to read books. And I actually have a couple of the books that I really love, like right here. Um, so one of them if you haven't read jennifer hillier yet i highly recommend she is just one of my favorites she's an amazing person amazing writer and little secrets is her latest and it is just um a really really dark story it's one of those stories actually it um gets darker as you get into it about a woman whose son went missing and then she discovers that her husband is having a relationship with another woman and that um, maybe her son didn't actually go missing after all. So it is a really dark, dark story. And then another one that I loved was They're Gone by EA Bars. I'm sorry, I'm tilting this the wrong way. Uh, but about two women whose husbands are murdered. Um, they're two women who don't know each other, but they do end up realizing the deaths are connected. And it's just like a delicious, delicious dark read. So those are two things lately. Um, that I really loved. I'm blanking now. Susan, you go and talk about stuff you've read lately. Well, I know I, there was a, I oh, I know the other one. I actually read this summer and blurbed, but it just came out this past week is last night at the Telegraph Club and it's by Melinda oh. Lowe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it is so fantastic. It has strong female characters, great history, lots of like LGBTQ uh, love affairs and um, a, like, astronomy and you know it's just like it's it's amazing science there it's like it has everything it crosses all the you know the things on my list at least that i love in a historic novel so melinda low all of her stuff is great actually i got to I do a really, I, sorry. no i'm I so sorry to... i was gonna say i got an advanced read of a book that um uh chris holmes next book actually Ooh. which just sold and it's called child zero and it is set in the future uh, during a, a different kind of pandemic, a world where antibiotics have stopped working, which because he's a scientist by trade, um, he actually worked in a lot of detail about how we're very close to a post antibiotic age. And so it is a wonderful read. It, the book won't be out for another year, but like, look for that. Mark, mark your calendar for probably summer of 2022. It is a great book. And so all of the other books for you guys who are watching, all the other ones that they mentioned um, are available now. And I've dropped links to all of those in the chats. I got to do a um, uh, YA, um, a gay YA high school panel uh, earlier this in the summer. And Melinda Lowe was one of the authors that I got to chat with. And because I had just oh. read the book that has like the, the hands dripping. I can't remember the title of it right now, but um, she was fantastic. And I'm really excited to read her new one too. Oh yeah, the the new it's like she's just gone to such. I, I read all of her books. Uh, we didn't go to Wellesley together, but we were both alums, and I interviewed her, and um, I love all of her books. And she has taken such a journey as an author, and she's so one of my favorites is Ash, which is a retelling of the Cinderella story. Um, but with this one, um, the Telegraph Club, it's just it's just so marvelous. Can I just say I'm enjoying the the cat? I don't, don't know which of the cats it is, but right behind John, it just made this amazing appearance. Oh, there we are. I was going to say, John, you did a conversation with David Slayton, who um, his White Trash Warlock was oh, another mm -hmm. book. I read that. I didn't yeah. just read that. I read that, I guess, earlier last year, but I yeah. absolutely love that. I guess that was like last summer. That was another great read. Yeah, me too. That was one of my favorites of last year. Yeah. And cat wise, it's eight o'clock and they get fed at eight o'clock. So since oh. Matt is not down here, he's like, it's time for my dinner, which means he will be like nibbling on me in a few minutes. But um, <laughs> so Judith says um, she's been noticing in new TV shows how they either depict or ignore the pandemic. Do you think it's it, do you think it's necessary to address that in a new book? 
And um, especially considering that things will have changed so much by the time the book comes out. What do you think, Hillary? So my next book actually does sort of address this. This was something I struggled with a little bit. The book that comes out in July, Her Last Breath, is set just, I was thinking as I wrote it, just a little bit in the future. It's set when most people have been vaccinated, but it's set in New York, and it's a New York that has been changed by the pandemic. And you see it in different ways. Um, you know, wealthy characters, their lives haven't really changed. They're back to socializing and traveling. But I, you know, you definitely see in Queens and in the Bronx, you know, boarded up businesses, which quite honestly, we've been seeing for quite a while already in New York. There are a lot of businesses that just, um, we've just been hit so hard here that they, you know, they didn't get the support they needed and um, they no longer exist. But it kind of envisioned a world where certain um, neighborhoods have just been hit so hard that people are still wearing masks and taking precautions. Um, it's in the background of the book. It's not by any means a pandemic thriller, but I realized kind of as a mystery writer, the pandemic was sort of a useful device for why you would have people who, for instance, are family members, but spent a lot of time apart and might not know certain details of each other's lives anymore. And that it sort of became like in the shadow of a lot of people's lives that they've lost someone or like it's it's impacted them in some way. So again, I like to deal in the real world. I like to set my books in real places and have those places seem real as much as possible. So while I'm not in any way writing medical thrillers or specifically about pandemics, I think that society is going to be marked by it. So it's, it's definitely a presence. Mm -hmm. Um, and Susan Leanne wants to know if you could mention the name of the mother and daughter that inspired the standalone one more time because she missed it. Oh, um, Sylvia and Grace Comfort. And I learned about them in a book titled Hitler in Los Angeles by Stephen R. Ross. Okay, perfect. And, and, there's, and very, there's very little on them. Um, I actually, uh, I, I couldn't go to a library, of course, because pandemic, but I had um, a librarian photocopy a lot of. Um, you know, boxed materials for me. And I've been working with that. So there's not a lot about them yet. So hopefully this will change that. And so the second part of her question um, was, is that book available? But Leanne, she is still writing it. So we have to wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think that that'll be like 2022. Yeah. But I did want to mention, though, that Susan's um, book from last year, King's Justice, will be out in paperback uh, in a week on February 2nd. And her new Maggie Hope book, The Hollywood Spy, will be out on July 6th. And as Hillary mentioned, she's got her next book called Her Last Breath coming out in July. Uh, so those are all available to pre-order from um, Murder by the Book or if you want to order any of their previous books. Um, before we head out, Susan, can you tell everybody just a little bit about who, who if they might not not if they might not know um, who Maggie Hope is and a little bit about the character in your series? Oh, sure. Yeah. So Maggie Hope's an American um, who is a young college graduate who moves to London and becomes involved in all kinds of mysteries and espionage and all kinds of things because she has a background in mathematics. So that serves her very well. And even though she's sort of discounted because she's a woman, um, she actually does her bit to help the war effort. That's a, that's a great elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you live with a character for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you both for joining us this evening. Before we head out, I'm going to do a couple just reminders for everybody. Like I said, all the books are available um, at murderbooks.com uh, or in store. You can give us a call. We are open for browsing. Not everybody has realized that we're open, but we've been open since Halloween. So please come in and visit us. We're limiting the number of people that are in the store. And of course, masks are required. Um, but we also understand that not everybody is ready to get out and about in the world. So we're doing mail order. We're doing... Um, free medium mail shipping on all orders over $75. And we're also doing a uh, curbside pickup. So if you don't want to come in, you can just give us a call and we can run books out to your car put them on a table out there. Uh, like I said, the um, video chat will archive once we're done. So if you missed any part of it or you just want to come back and watch it again, it will be available on the store's Facebook channel and YouTube, as well as all of the other uh, events we have done. Um, Keep checking back because I'm sure, guys, that we will do something with both Hillary and Susan when their new books come out later this summer. Um, 
And I think that's all I needed to do for a wrap up, but I'm so, yeah, go ahead. Just one a tiny thing. I feel terrible because, of course, you can't sign books these days. I just wanted to mention anyone who buys um, any of my books from Murder by the Book, just drop me a line because I have book plates that I'd be happy to sign and mail out to you. So please just let me know. My website's my name, HillaryDavidson.com. So just drop me a line and let me know and I'll mail that out. We appreciate that. And uh, thank you both so much for chatting with us tonight. Like uh, we were saying with Susan beforehand, we're, I'm so I'm so bummed that we couldn't do this in the <sighs> store. Um, you guys have been such just such friends of the staff in the store for so long. It's it's great to be able to do it this way. But it's also really sad because, you know, we miss getting to hug your necks and get to see you. But, you know, this is the we'll next best thing. We yeah. will. We absolutely. We, Susan and I were joking already because our next books come out so soon together. Like we're going to go on tour together. Possibly not this year, depending on how, how quickly not. people are vaccinated. But maybe next year. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing to see you guys in person. And the store has always been so supportive. So you know, I really appreciate you. We both appreciate you. It's you guys have been wonderful. So absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So y'all have a good evening. Everybody who's been watching, y'all take care and we will see you all soon. Okay. Thanks Bye. so much. Night, everybody.